And that probably deserves a little bit of explanation. So I'm going to go back to this diagram here. We said before that light comes from electrons falling from high energy to low energy. But most things in physics can happen in reverse. So if a light wave comes in and strikes this electron when it's at a lower energy level, it gives it enough energy to lift it up to a higher energy level. And in this case, a blue light, which has more energy than red light, a blue light might lift it all the way up to the top uh, energy level of the hydrogen atom. But what if we, if it's hit by something that has even more energy than blue light? What if it's hit by ultraviolet? Well, in that case, it could lift the electron completely out of the atom. It could knock it completely free. We call that ionizing it. And, uh, just, and the electron just flies away. Now, why do we care about that? Well, because you may remember from your chemistry class that the molecules that we're made up, that we're made of, are the molecules are held together with covalent bonds, where you have two atoms that are sharing a pair of electrons. And if an ultraviolet ray comes along and hits one of those electrons and knocks it away, now there's nothing holding the molecule together and the atoms fall apart. And our proteins fall apart or our DNA falls apart, whatever. The, the, the tissues start to, start, start to disintegrate. They start to come apart. Now, if this only happens a little bit, our body does have the ability to repair it and put it back together. Even DNA, if it's just one spot, uh, we have ways to, to put it back together. But if it happens in a lot of places at the same time, then it may be permanent damage that we can't recover from. So ultraviolet light is the stuff that gives us sunburn. It has enough energy to actually start disassembling our molecules. Now, So that's the one that has lots of energy. In contrast, infrared is just warmth. We use that for heating lamps. We use that for um, actually television remote controls or game controllers uh, because the infrared uh, light doesn't take a lot of energy. So the batteries last longer for, uh, when, when, we are, when we're only shining out infrared light. So uh, infrared we use for uh, re reheating food, uh, keeping uh, premature infants warm. We shine infrared lights on them to keep, the, keep their temperature up. Uh, we use it for remote controls because it doesn't take much energy. And that thing about use, shining them on premature infants, we would never use ultraviolet light for that purpose because the, the babies would get sunburned and that would be somewhat counterproductive. So we use infrared light because it's less energy. It just warms them without harming their tissues in any way. Okay, so infrared is less energy per photon. Ultraviolet is more. Now let's continue on down below. At the very bottom end, we have radio waves. And these are the longest wavelength electromagnetic waves that, that, that exist. Uh, and we use these for radio, like in your car radio, and for TV broadcasts. Um, and yeah, they're very, very long. They are they can be kilometers long, one wavelength of this thing, very long wavelength. Now, above that, we have microwaves. And this word micro means very, very small, but microwaves are only small in comparison to radio waves. When they were first doing the research on this stuff and figuring all this out, radio waves were the first ones that they discovered, and they were able to determine that they were very, very long wavelength. And as they did more research, they found other radio-type waves, but they were much shorter wavelength. They said, we'll call those microwaves. Um, so microwaves are kind of sandwiched in between radio waves, and then they overlap with the infrared, and more on the overlapping a little bit a little bit later. So anyway, microwaves, we use them for a lot of the same purposes as radio waves for communication. We do that a lot. Uh, we also use them in microwave ovens. There are certain frequencies of microwaves that will cause water molecules and certain fat molecules to resonate. We learned about resonating last time. So it transfers their energy to those water molecules. And when they shake, they rub against each other, they cause friction, and they heat the food that the water or the fat or both is in. Microwave ovens work that way. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, we also use microwaves for communication, as I said, and there's some overlap. There's radio waves and microwave frequencies, which are now very often used for cell phone towers, uh, for Bluetooth, uh, for a lot of our wild wireless connection, Wi-Fi, that sort of thing. They, those are done in the radio and the microwave bands, some both, some of both. Okay, moving up to the high end, we have ultraviolet uh, radiation. Uh, and as we said, that we try to protect ourselves because that uh, um, uh, causes sunburn. 
Um, it's also used in uh, uh, black light to make things fluoresce. So um, ultraviolet light has enough energy to lift electrons up within molecules and within atoms. And then when those atoms, uh, those electrons drop back down, they glow with light. So it makes things fluoresce. So uh, day glow dyes um, are actually using ultraviolet light from the sun or from artificial lights to make the ink itself glow. Um, it looks bright because it actually is producing its own light, it converts ultraviolet light into visible light. So uh, that's one of the things we use ultraviolet light for. Now, if we go above ultraviolet light, we go to x-rays. And as you know, x-rays are used for x-raying your teeth or x-raying your arm if you think you might have a broken arm or something like that. And this kind of makes sense because ultraviolet light has enough energy to penetrate your skin and damage your, your tissues. X-rays go blasting all the way through you. That's why you can take a picture of your bones because the light is literally intense enough or energetic enough to pass through your tissues. And some of it is soaked up by the bones, so it makes a shadowy image on, uh, on, on photographic paper. Um, so x-rays, they have more energy than ultraviolet light. So x-rays are even more dangerous than ultraviolet light because where ultraviolet light may knock away one electron and that's it, x-rays have so much energy that they can just go from one atom to the next, knocking electrons away like bowling pins. And they're much more penetrating. It's not just going to do damage to your skin and give you skin cancer. It gives you cancer wherever it happens to go through. So high doses of x-rays, long-term exposure to x-rays is very dangerous because it is penetrating and it does damage your, uh, your genes and, your, and the proteins in your, in your body. Now, it's useful because you can take pictures of it, but we want to do that at a minimum. Now, you may recall when you get an x-ray at the doctor or at the dentist, they put a lead apron on you to protect the parts of you that are not being x-rayed from that x-ray radiation. And you have probably noticed that the x-ray technician, the person there that's setting everything up and taking the picture, they leave the room or they hide behind a big lead shield when they actually take the x-ray because they're there for dozens of x-rays every day. And if they're getting blasted by x-ray radiation every time, it's gonna be really, really bad for them. So yeah, x-rays have even more energy than ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet light. Now, finally, that leaves us with gamma rays. And gamma rays are the most energetic of all. Um, they're, sometimes they're called high energy x-rays, uh, but they even go beyond the realm of x-rays. Gamma rays are really, really dangerous. They carry so much energy with them that um, they do significant damage when they pass when they pass through somebody. Um, now, things that we use them for 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 positive purposes, uh, they're used sometimes in cancer treatment because if you make a beam, a tight focused beam of gamma rays, you can fire it all the way through somebody. So if I had a brain tumor in the center of my skull or someplace inside my brain that they couldn't reach with surgery, you could shine a beam of gamma rays through it and cause damage to that, to that tumor with the gamma rays. Now, it's also causing damage on the way in and the way out to everything else. So what they do is they change the angle of the beam. So it comes in from different angles. And all of those beams always go through the tumor, but they go through different things on the way through. So the rest of my head would not get the same uh, dose of gamma radiation as the tumor does. And hopefully it's enough to kill the, gam to kill the tumor, but not the rest of me. Um, knock on wood. Um, so that's one thing, cancer, cancer uh, treatment. Um, another thing that we use gamma rays for is to sterilize food. So if you have 200 pounds of hamburger that you've ground together with pieces from many, many different cows, and you think it may be contaminated with some bacteria from somewhere along the way, well, you can blast the whole tub of ground beef with gamma rays, and it will kill all the bacteria in there. And then it won't spoil. It will greatly extend its shelf, its shelf life. They do the same thing with produce, with lettuce and celery and vegetables that are going to be transported across the country, fruit. Um, if you didn't do this, then the microbes and molds and bacteria and stuff would cause the produce to rot before you could get it across the country. But by blasting it with gamma rays, um, it extends the shelf life. Um, it looks like a giant uh, airport x-ray machine that, that does this. Now, this isn't publicized and advertised very much because some people think, well, wouldn't that make the food radioactive? Um, 
and it does not, but enough people don't know that, that they just don't want to go there. But yeah, this is a very common way to sterilize food. Um, now, if you're wondering, well, how can it not make the, the food radioactive? Well, remember, gamma rays are just light rays. It's, it's more intense light than what we can see, but it's still just light. So if I shine a flashlight on myself and I turn off the light, I'm not glowing with that light. When the light goes away, the light goes away. Uh, and the same thing is true with gamma rays. When you, when you stop bombarding the head of lettuce with gamma rays, um, it's just you turn it off the light. The gamma rays, they go wherever they go and that's it. Um, okay, so that's the different types of, uh, of uh, electromagnetic radiation. There are seven bands in the, uh, in the spectrum, and you need to know what they are, what order they come in, what has the most energy, what has the least energy, what has the longest wavelength, what has the shortest wavelength, things that we can, uh, that we can do with each of them, and the order that they fall. So those seven are the radio and TV, microwaves, infrared, then visible light. That's not uh, labeled in this particular one, but visible light is a band. Ultraviolet light, x-rays, and gamma rays. And notice that a lot of these overlap. So microwaves overlap with infrared. And this is because there are some things that you can do with microwaves. And you can do it over a pretty broad range of frequencies. And there are other things that you can do with infrared rays, and you can do them over a fairly broad range of frequencies. But some of the things you can do with infrared, you can also do with microwaves and vice versa. So there's some overlap there. Same thing with UV and x-rays. There's some overlap depending on what you're doing and how you define them. And then very large overlap between x-rays and gamma rays, as I said before. The only one where there's not a barrier is between radio waves and microwaves, and that is defined as one meter. So if the wavelength is less than one meter, it's a microwave. If the wavelength is more than one meter, then by definition, it's radio wave. Um, and I guess we also define the edges of visible light as what we can see, but that's it. Um, okay, last thing. Um, you may wonder, well, is there any part of this that we haven't discovered yet? And the answer is no. We know definitively that we know the entire electromagnetic spectrum because radio waves are defined as anything with a wavelength longer than one meter. Um, so you could have a, a, a radio wave which is 10 million miles long, a, a wavelength of 10 million miles. It's still a radio wave. And if you had an infinite wavelength, you'd have zero energy. So we define the zero energy end of the spectrum as radio waves. Now, conversely, over with gamma rays, gamma rays carry enormous amounts of energy. Um, uh, enough energy at the very, very high end that sometimes they don't even remain gamma rays. They do the E equals MC squared trick and they actually turn into a little piece of matter. They turn into a particle. So remember, E equals MC squared is the, says that you can transform energy into mass and mass into energy. And very, very high energy gamma rays actually do this. They kind of condense, they're not light anymore, and they become some sort of a massive particle. So, and you can't get any more energetic than that. Uh, so gamma rays top out where they have so much energy that they can't even exist as light anymore. And since we've defined the maximum and the minimum and everything in between, that's all there is. There is no more bands. There's no more electromagnetic radiation to discover. Okay, that's a bit. I imagine this is going to be at least two parts, but if you need it, it's here. And uh, thank you for your time. We'll see you next time.